Hello everybody, my name is Mariako, and today we're going to take a look at the upcoming 1.12 update for Minecraft. We'll be focusing primarily on the survival related changes, but I will try to mention every important change at least briefly. With the pre-release already available, it's safe to say that this update will be coming to a world near you in the very near future. So let's take a look at all of the new changes and find out why this new version has been dubbed the World of Color update. Getting right to it, the World of Color update is doing more than just adding some colorful blocks to the game. It's making the colors that already exist across the game more consistent as a whole. A more consistent color palette has been made, and most blocks that can be dyed or have their color changed have been tweaked to suit that. This change has affected wool, carpets, banners, shulkers, shulker boxes, beacon beams, and even sheep, some of which look virtually the same as they did before, while others are noticeably more vibrant. There is one temporary exception to this, which is the purple shulker texture. Those have been left how they were so that they can continue to match the purple blocks of the end cities, but when the block ID system is fixed, likely in 1.13, we will have both a default shulker texture as well as a dedicated purple one with the new color. You can expect nearly any dyeable blocks added in the future to follow these same color patterns, including the brand new blocks that we're covering next. The first of which being the new concrete powder block. This block looks very similar to a dyed sand block, even behaving like sand with gravity allowing them to fall when placed. They have a surprisingly versatile texture, especially when you consider the variety of colors available, and I expect we'll be seeing them used in a lot of different types of builds. These can be crafted using any color dye along with four sand and four gravel in a crafting table, finally giving gravel a worthwhile use. This crafting recipe is also shapeless, and the items can be placed in the crafting bench in any order. These concrete powder blocks do have one particularly unique property as well, and that's what happens when they come into contact with water. When this block touches water, even if the water doesn't flow into it directly, the concrete powder will be transformed into a different type of block. That new block is concrete, and you can pick it up by simply mining it with a pick. This block is the answer to anybody who wanted a super smooth block in the game and wasn't satisfied with what hardened clay provided previously, whether because it was still slightly rough or because of the reddish tint that all the colors had. These new concrete blocks are nearly perfectly smooth and come in the same vibrant colors that wool does, so they're a fantastic option for all sorts of things, from modern buildings to pixel art. Since we brought up hardened clay, now would be a good time to mention that it's actually no longer called that. From now on, hardened clay is officially named terracotta. The reason for this change is the introduction of yet another new block. That block is the glazed terracotta, a new type of block that you get when you cook any of the colored terracotta blocks in a furnace. These are super vibrant and highly detailed blocks that can be placed in four different directions, giving us quite a few unique patterns to work with when we put them together, though utilizing those patterns usually means we have to work with even numbers in our builds, which can be a bit cumbersome. These blocks are quite substantially different from any other block that we currently have in the game, and as a result they've been pretty controversial, with most people either specifically loving or hating them. But regardless of how you feel about them, they are going to be sticking around. That is, unless of course you're referring to sticking to slime blocks, as glazed terracotta is one of the few blocks that doesn't always stick to them. Their behavior can be a little bit confusing at first, but basically they will not attach to slime blocks that are pushed around them, nor will they attach to sticky pistons that are trying to pull them, though they can still be pushed by pistons. They will, however, attach to slime blocks that are pushing them directly. This is a behavior unique to these blocks, so it can throw people off at first. Just keep it in mind when you're working with your slime block contraptions. Continuing with the colorful theme, we finally have the long-requested ability to get beds in all of the different colors allowing us to use beds and have them actually work with our builds, rather than just having to accept that they were always going to be bright red. These can be made by crafting a bed with wool of only the color that you want, though it is also possible to craft a white bed and then dye it the color you'd like afterwards. In addition to the new colors, the beds also have a slightly updated model, making their legs 3D, and they also have one other interesting new property. Beds are now bouncy, similar to slime blocks, though somewhat less effective. You won't bounce quite as high as with slime blocks, and you do still take fall damage when landing on the bed, though it is reduced by about 50%. This means a drop of about 41 blocks is survivable without feather falling, or from slightly higher up if you have full saturation to get some regen in before you land a second time. 
There are also some less colorful changes to existing blocks as well, the first being that the back and bottom of stairs are now considered to be solid blocks. The most noticeable side effect of this is that more things will connect or place onto stairs that didn't previously. Things like fences and glass panes will connect to the back of stairs if they are nearby, while torches, levers, buttons, or ladders can be placed on the back of stairs, and snow layers can now go on the top of upside down stairs, none of which was possible previously. Do note that this only applies to the back and bottom of stairs. None of the new connections hop into any of the other sides. This change is a bit of a trade-off. Inevitably, a lot of current builds and designs are going to be thrown off by this new behavior, but it also opens up a lot of possibilities for new stuff as well. We've also gotten the long-awaited change to how paintings work, allowing us to target a specific size. The way they decided to implement this was by making paintings take up the largest area available to them. Depending on the direction the wall is facing, the painting will expand out from where it's placed. So if you only want a one-wide painting, for example, you would place a block in the direction it's extending out to. If you're after one of the 2 by one paintings, you would simply place a block over the top of where you're placing the painting. It's not the most elegant solution in the world, but the majority of the time, it does make things easier. Another change to a classic block, the note block has had its sound repertoire doubled from five different instruments up to ten. Until now, the note block had remained functionally the same since the early days of beta, but as of 1.12, we will have the additional ability to play bell, flute, chime, guitar, and xylophone sounds as well. I'm sure the musically inclined Minecraft players will use these for all sorts of cool stuff, but even those of us without much musical talent can still get some nice sound effects for our worlds and maths with these. To get these new sounds, you will place one of the following blocks beneath the note block. Bone blocks will give you the xylophone. Wool will give you the guitar. Clay will give you the flute. Packed ice will give you the chime. And the gold block will give you the bell. In addition to those new note block sounds, we also have a handful of new game sounds for existing actions as well. Those are boats paddling, both casting and reeling in fishing rods, throwing an eye of ender and that eye of ender breaking, and putting an Eye of Ender into an end portal frame, as well as activating that end portal. This update also brings in two new mobs, the first being rather appropriate for the World of Color update. Minecraft now has parrots. These are completely passive mobs that you will find fluttering around your jungle biomes. They are treated like most passive mobs, so while it may be easiest to find them in new jungles, it is still fully possible to find them in old terrain, and once they pop up, they will never despawn. The parrots can show up in five different colors. Red, green, blue, cyan, and gray. And they can also be tamed as pets. To tame them, you will simply right-click them while holding a cookie, similar to how we tame most other mobs. Though do note that you currently can't breed them together. Once tamed, they will fly after you as you walk around and teleport to you if you get too far away, similar to how tamed ocelots and wolves do. Also, like other pets, you can right-click them to make them sit to prevent them from moving. But there is one other way to keep them safe, and that's to keep them on your shoulder. If you walk into a parrot you've tamed, they will hop onto your shoulder and ride along with you. Though, unfortunately, that usually doesn't last too long, as currently jumping will make them fly off. Perhaps they will eventually change to something like sneaking and right-clicking to place the bird down, or something along those lines, so we can actually reliably keep them with us. The parrots will also mimic noises around them, specifically mob noises. If there's any hostile mobs within about a 20 block radius, the parrot will make a slightly higher pitched version of that mob's noises. This could be seen as a mob alarm of some sort, but mostly it's just funny hearing different mob noises with a higher pitch. <laughs> <laughs> the parrots also have a rather adorable habit of following other mobs around, both passive and hostile, and they also have a love for music. If you put a record into a jukebox, any parrots in the area will start grooving out to it, though with certain records that's a little bit strange.
And before you get any sinister ideas, the only thing these parrots drop on death is a couple of normal feathers. So there's no need to massacre our feathered little friends here. The second new mob added to the game is the Illusioner. As you may have guessed, this is a new addition to the Illager family, and probably the most dangerous one of all, despite looking like he's wearing pajamas. The Illusioner uses a combination of bow and magic to attack any player, villager, or iron golem that they come across. He will continuously bombard his target with arrows, and he will also generate four clones of himself that will split as soon as he is first hit. These clones themselves don't actually attack, though they will appear to pull their bow back. Instead, the real body will turn invisible and shoot at you from the cover of these clones. The main body will always be close to these doppelgangers, frequently in the middle of their little group, and you will need to attack past the clones in order to hit him. Each time that you do land a hit, the clones will momentarily group up together and then spread back out, and the fight will continue as normal. As if that wasn't enough, if the local difficulty of the area you're in is high enough, over 3, the Illusioner will also cast a 20 second blindness effect on you when the fight first starts. This is really quite nasty to deal with if you just charge in, especially if there's other mobs in the area that you could run into, so do keep it in mind if you're playing on a high difficulty setting. Unfortunately, as of right now, we don't actually know if the Illusioner will be available in 1.12 for survival players. How they are meant to spawn hasn't been implemented yet, and we don't actually know how they're intended to. There's two main theories as to why this is the case. One is that the Illusioner simply isn't what Mojang wants him to be mechanically and isn't done yet. The other is that maybe the Illusioner will have a unique circumstance for spawning, rather than just being thrown into the Woodland Mansion with the rest of the Illagers. So either that circumstance where his spawning isn't ready, or Mojang could be holding out and revealing it only with the full release. As of right now, we just don't know, and it's definitely possible that we won't be seeing the Illusioner spawning naturally until 1.12.1, or perhaps even until 1.13. For right now, only the folks at Mojang know the answer to that. There is one very prevalent theme in 1.12 that we haven't yet covered, and that's that they're making the game vastly more accessible for new players, and making it so external sources, like the wiki, aren't absolutely essential to play. The most basic step done for this is a very small tutorial-esque series of notifications you can see the very first time that you start a brand new world, which will pop up in the top right corner. These are just a short walkthrough of the first few steps that players should take in the game, and they'll only show up if you don't start playing immediately, so experienced players will likely never even see these. Players are further guided along by the new advancement system, a system that is directly replacing the old achievements. At its most basic level, it serves as a good guideline for players to follow, giving them hints as to how to progress through the game and what they could be doing next. It still doesn't hold the player's hand at all, but it does provide some sense of direction for new players and lets them know things like, for example, that they need to acquire obsidian and then build something called a nether portal. Currently, by default, there are five different tabs. The Minecraft, Nether, and End tabs serve as guides for progressing through the different dimensions of the game, while the Husbandry tab contains advancements relating to crops and animals, and the Adventure tab contains more general achievement type things, like discovering all the biomes or shooting a skeleton from 50 plus blocks away. When you get an advancement, you will see a little pop-up in the top right of your screen, similar to the mini-tutorial mentioned earlier, as well as a message in your chat. Most advancements will have yellow text, though particularly challenging ones will use purple instead. On top of this, the advancement system is a phenomenal tool for map makers. Unlike the previous achievement system, advancements are completely customizable via JSON files, and allow map makers to create their own goals for players to achieve. They can even be made to trigger commands, allowing map makers to actually reward players for reaching certain points down the advancement tree, and much more. Their functionality actually goes way beyond this, to the point of custom advancements mimicking method recursion and the ability to call functions. That's way beyond the scope of this overview, just know that it's a very big deal for map making, and it's not the only one in this update either. More on that later. There is one more significant change that will make the game easier to get into. But this one is truly beneficial for everybody, and that is the new recipe book. This is a little book icon that will show up near your crafting grid, both in your inventory as well as in crafting tables. Clicking that icon will bring up another new window that shows you everything that you've learned how to craft and the ingredients needed to do so. Though do note that the items that require a full 3x3 crafting grid won't show up in the recipe book open from your inventory since you won't have enough space to craft them anyway. Basically, if you're familiar with modded Minecraft, this is kind of the vanilla version of NEI or JEI. 
As you play the game and acquire various materials, you will unlock the recipes that use those materials, and the game will notify you of this with the now familiar pop-up in the top right of your screen. From then on, anytime you click into the recipe book, you will be able to see how those items are crafted, meaning new players will actually have a way of knowing what blocks and items exist, and experienced players won't have to tab out to remember some of those obscure recipes that they rarely use. Do note that this does not mean that you're blocked from crafting anything. The recipe book is merely a reference and not something that changes your gameplay, at least by default. Its usefulness doesn't end there though, as it's not just showing you what's necessary for the recipe, but it is actually filling in the crafting grid with the items necessary to craft it. If you're missing an item, it will be highlighted red in the crafting grid, but if you have everything you need, it will all be filled in and you can simply pull that item out like you normally would. Each subsequent click on the item in the recipe book will attempt to put another set of materials in, so you can craft multiple times at once, and if you shift click one of the items in the recipe book, it will fill the recipe in as many times as it can with the resources that you have available, making it a great way to handle quickly crafting large amounts of items. Items that have multiple variants, like doors and fences, are grouped together into a single icon. To get the exact one you want, you have to hold down left click, which will open up a panel showing you all of the different options. The only big thing that I feel is still missing from this is a way to automatically pull the finished item out from the crafting grid. For example, right-clicking a recipe could automatically craft the item and put it into our inventories, rather than just putting the ingredients into the grid. If something like that were added, it would make cumbersome recipes like the dispenser much more bearable to craft in bulk. Hopefully that is something we'll see in the future. Speaking of crafting, there has been one other quality of life change to it. Any items that you have left in a crafting grid, whether a crafting table or in your inventory screen, will automatically be pulled back into your inventory when you close the window, rather than just being chucked out into the world like they did previously. Next is a new feature referred to as the narrator. This is a text-to-speech tool that will read out everything that's put into chat, or only specific types of things, like specifically just chat or specifically just commands, depending on what it is set to, and you can configure this setting in your chat settings in the options menu. Narrator narrates all. Miriako, I'm a little teapot, short and stout. There were also a couple small changes to creative mode, most notably the introduction of saving toolbars. This allows you to save and load specific combinations of items onto your toolbar while in creative mode, so you could, for example, have one bar set up dedicated to working with redstone and quickly swap between that and a toolbar you have for a particular building style that you're working with. You can change the keys that you do this with in your controls menu, but by default, you save a toolbar by holding C and pressing a number key, and then you can load it back up by holding down X and pressing that same number. You can also see a preview of your saved toolbars in the Creative Menu tab called Save Toolbars, which uses the bookshelf as an icon and is found up near the compass icon that you use to search. If you've ever wanted to completely erase one of your toolbars, you simply have to save an empty toolbar in its place. The Creative Menu was also restructured slightly, with the Miscellaneous and Materials tabs being merged together as one. There have also been some massive changes to commands and map making. I'm not going to get into the details of these changes here, as it's a pretty niche subject and covering these changes properly would require a dedicated overview of their own. The brief explanation is that between the advancement system, with its ability to call commands and run numerous different checks, the new function system that allows mapmakers to create predefined groups of commands to run, the ability to control what recipes players have access to, some changes to command blocks that make them much faster and allow much easier implementation of logic, and tons of other little changes as well, all combines to allow for some amazing creations from the map making community. In many ways, this update is taking Minecraft's map making more towards being like scripting or programming, rather than cobbling together weird workarounds and tricks. If you're interested in learning more about these changes and how to utilize them yourself, I would highly recommend checking out Slice Lime's YouTube channel, which I'll have a link down below. In addition to all kinds of other content, he also does some fantastic and very in-depth coverage of these more mapmaker-focused changes to the game. There are also quite a few smaller things that are still worth mentioning, which are players' bodies no longer turn sideways when they're running backwards, terracotta, or the hardened clay type, not the glazed, now have a unique, slightly darker color on in-game maps, magma blocks burn infinitely when lit, similar to netherrack, and Minecraft is now on Java 8. 
If you don't know what that means, don't worry, it does nothing to affect your gameplay at all, it's mostly just a nice thing for modders. There have been some noteworthy bug fixes as well. The first being that hoppers and droppers will be able to put water bottles into brewing stands after they're automatically pulled out via a hopper. This was a bug introduced in 1.11 and broke most automated brewing systems, so it's nice to see this fixed. You can also now sleep when a passive zombie pigman is near. Previously, it would give you a monsters are nearby warning and would not allow you to sleep, though it is still a little bit awkward. And they've also fixed a bug that would make your tamed dogs kill your tamed cats if you accidentally hit them. Yeah, that was a bad one. So, with that, I do believe we've covered pretty much everything you need to know about Minecraft 1.12, at least beyond some of the complex map making stuff. You should now be fully prepared for the World of Color update when it finally reaches our worlds and servers, presumably within the next week or two. If you have any questions about any of the features, feel free to ask me and I will help you out as best I can. That's all I've got for you guys today. Hopefully it was helpful, and I'll see you guys next time.